Welcome to our Spearheading a Safer Internet virtual event. I'm Sarah Fisher, media reporter for Axios, and I'm coming to you from our headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course on Axios.com. Join the conversation today on Twitter using at Axios and the hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague, Ina Freed. Today, February 8th, is Safer Internet Day, and we'll examine the importance of user protections amid increased cyber attacks, and we'll also look at how decision makers are working at making the internet a safer place for everyone. Our first guest is Eric Hahn, head of US Safety for TikTok. Thank you, Eric, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I wanted to start with news of the day. TikTok announced this morning that you're going to be making some changes to the way that you do content moderation. And specifically, you're going to be going a little bit more granular with some of your policies. So for example, you're no longer just policing for diet disorders, but you're going to be policing for things that are related to that. Maybe things like extreme weightlifting or extreme working out. Walk us through that change and how you're going to be doing that without potentially running into some free speech issues. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's a really good question. And I'll take a short opportunity to remind your audience what TikTok actually is. I think most people know, but just in case. But for us, TikTok has always been a community-powered entertainment platform. It's, for myself personally, incredibly humbling to see so many creative and talented people create on the TikTok community. And when it comes to creativity, for us on our safety team, our core principle has always been the belief that people are at their most creative when they feel safe. Um, at TikTok, we believe that a person's ability to express themselves creatively in a safe, secure, and welcoming environment is paramount. And that's why community guidelines are so important. They establish a set of norms, a foundation, for people to understand what's allowed and what's not allowed on the platform. So as you mentioned, today we're announcing uh, updated community guidelines, and they're going to roll over and roll out for the next few weeks. And there's a lot in it, some of it which you uh, already mentioned. And I'll talk a bit about uh, the few things in there that are emblematic of the progress that we're making. So first and foremost, we've always said, for example, we want to foster a more inclusive and welcoming platform. And a lot of feedback that we've gotten in the past was to be more specific about what it is we don't allow and not allow, especially with regards to hateful behavior ideologies. And one of the bits of feedback from our content advisory council, for example, says those specifics can be very impactful to the communities that care about them. So we're making it clear that offenses like misogyny or misgendering, which have long been prohibited on our platform, are not allowed under our hateful behavior policies. Moreover, to your point, one of the updates that we're, we're um, announcing as well is how do we aim to support the well-being of our community? So parts of that is expanding the type of content related to eating disorders that we will remove. So for instance, instead of strictly removing content that is uh, traditionally seen as eating disorder content, we'll also begin to remove disordered eating content. So that means um, think about extreme calorie counting or content promoting uh, what might be seen as overexercise. As mentioned, those okay, are just a few. Oh, go ahead. No, I just want to kind of push back for a second because I think that your community values the safety, of course, with changing the types of content you're recommending. But there is a concern that there's some sort of filtration happening here that could actually harm people's ability to upload content that might bring a specific community joy. You know, if you are an extreme weightlifter, why can't you upload that type of video? What are you doing to make sure people don't feel censored? That's a really good question. And I think for any trust and safety team, there's always a challenge between consistency and context, right? Consistency meaning how can our policies be equal for everybody under the eyes of the community guideline, but also bringing in contextual signals of why you are using or publishing certain types of content. So for example, machines do a really good job at identifying objects or patterns or colors. So blood, for example, but they don't do a really good job at telling you that, hey, this video is actually something uh, from uh, educational documentary footage for a medical procedure. So that's why there's always technology and people coming into place. For this in particular, for us, it's always making sure that uh, and recognizing that diversity on our platform is something that our, our creators want. So too much of anything, whether it's animals, fitness tips, 
personal well-being uh, doesn't fit with the diverse discovery experience we aim to create. So part of that is making sure that we're testing diversification, making sure filter bubbles don't get created. So for example, within fitness, it's absolutely okay for you to say, here's my Peloton score. Or just yesterday, I deadlifted 250 pounds for the first time, right? I want to talk about those things. But all of that within a single video is probably fine, potentially problematic if it's viewed in a cluster. So let's go back to some of the recommendations that you were talking about. We had a question from our audience that wants to know how you're handling things like hoaxes or viral challenges that might be appearing in someone's For You page as a part of a recommended video. Um, what's your stance on those types of things? We've seen how they've led to some challenges in schools and what are you doing to take action on them? Yeah, to be very clear, any content that promotes dangerous behaviors would be a violation of our community guidelines. Our moderation teams uh, work very diligently to swiftly and expeditiously remove that violative content and redirect hashtags when someone might be searching for it uh, in our search page. So for example, if you search for something that we've determined is a dangerous challenge, you won't find content around that. We're also working to educate people around online challenges and steps they can take to assess viral warnings, including hoaxes. As you mentioned, there have been quite a few hoaxes, not just on TikTok, but the internet writ large, and trying to make sure that uh, people understand what is real and what is not real. And we have more on that within our safety center. Speaking of our safety center, we have resources that include uh, guidance for teens and what to do if they see an online challenge. And we try to be really pithy with it. So it's in four steps. One is stop, pause for a moment, think, is it safe? Is it harmful? Is it real? Aspects of digital literacy that we want to impress on our users. Decide, is it risky or is it harmful? If you're not sure if it is, don't do it. Uh, and act, report harmful challenges in app. Don't share them. Make sure that people know that it's it's something that uh, shouldn't be uh, participated in within our ecosystem. I'm happy you mentioned reporting bad content that you see, but that can't be the only mechanism that you have to make sure that type of stuff comes down, right? Like eventually it's going to have to be a combination of people reporting what they see, but also your own technology catching stuff, right? Yes, exactly. And that's going back to my earlier point around context and consistency, right? Trust and safety work has always been a combination of technology and people. Technology, as mentioned, does a really good job at saying that looks like an object that may potentially be violated. Think a hate symbol or hateful iconography. But humans are the ones that can come in and say, let me give you the context of whether the, this is promoting a hateful ideology or if it's a history PhD or professor talking about the history uh, of, of World War II, for example. So parts of that is not just user reports, but we have machine learning technology to help us provide consistent uh, potential violations on platform. We also have a number of third party uh, partnerships, whether it's from a threat intelligence perspective or advocacy civil society groups like our content advisory council to help flag some of these things for us so we can investigate from a policy and moderation perspective. But how much does your tech actually catch up front? Like before someone ever sees it, are you catching most of that stuff? Or are you waiting until it goes viral to take it down? That's a really great question. I think in our uh, upcoming community guidelines, you'll see a little bit of uh, where we're coming from. In our most rec recent enforcement numbers, we removed around 91 million videos. Most of that content, I believe it's, and you could check my work here, I think more than 90% of that content was either removed before zero views or removed before a user reported to us. So again, going back to making sure that technology comes into place to recognize hey, this is an object or this is a imagery that we know might be uh, a violative just from its image, but also using people in our moderation and policy teams to give us that context to make sure that we're making accurate and informed decisions. We talked about this in the sense of safety, thinking about physical health, and dieting, for example, but let's talk about this in terms of society. We know that misinformation tends to be a huge issue ahead of elections. How are you thinking about cracking those filter bubbles with the new policies that you debuted this morning as it pertains to things like political speech? 
Yeah, this isn't new to us. Uh, I think we had a lot of learnings, especially with the U.S. presidential elections in which we had a task force of many smart individuals across trust and safety, security, product, our engineering and R&D teams. And we learned a lot from that. So uh, parts of it right now is as we're coming up to the midterms, for example, in November, we want to keep the things that we need work, which is that cross cross functional uh, task force that we have partnerships that we have with many different advocacy, civil society, and uh, security partnerships, and look at the things that we wanted to improve on or lessons learned from the U.S. presidential elections. From right now, we feel pretty good from a policy standpoint. So for example, we ban paid political ads. We're going to continue doing that. Election misinformation is not something that should proliferate on our platform. These are policies we've had in place since day one, and we recognize that an election heightens that and obviously, as the context uh, uh, accentuates some of that, we're looking for ways to improve we have just quality. A few minutes right. left. Yeah, Sorry, we have just ahead. a few minutes left. So I want to get to one last question here, which is minor safety. Obviously, you have a lot of users under the plat on the platform who might not be, you know, official adults and might be minors. Quickly, what are you doing to make sure that those people uh, are not being exploited? Great question. My team's job is to ensure the well-being of our entire community. That's our highest priority, and that's especially true for teens. So for us on the policy and moderation side, we hire experts in topics like adolescent development, and they help us design policies and product features with this development lens in mind. For instance, when you're thinking about the product experience, TikTok has different experiences based on how old you are. So for example, if you're under 13, you have the TikTok for younger user experience highly curated, age-appropriate content. We have a partnership with Common Sense Networks to help us develop what age-appropriate means. In the full context or TikTok experience, you have teens from 13 to 15 that have private accounts by default. They can't host a live stream. They can't send direct messages. And for users 16 to 17, they have features like DMs or, or downloads set to default to help or default off to help them encourage whether or not they want to think about turning that back on and for what reasons. In addition to those safeguards, we also have robust parental controls. So for example, we have our family pairing feature in which parents and guardians could pair up their own accounts to their teen's account. And through that pairing, the caretaker can manually adjust content and privacy settings for their teen. Super interesting how you have it segmented amongst different minor populations. Uh, Eric Hahn, thank you so much again for joining us today, head of TikTok's US Safety. Thank you, Sarah, appreciate it. And now, a view from the top. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you to our sponsor, Google, for making this conversation possible. My name is Mia Boykins, and I'm a global entrepreneur and speaker. Now joining us from Sunnyvale, California, the Senior Vice President of Core Systems and Experiences at Google, Jen Fitzpatrick. Welcome, Jen. Thanks. Hi, Mia. Thank you so much for joining us. With your extensive background at Google, it's safe to say you've seen the digital world change over the last decades. So let's just jump right into the questions. From your perspective, enlighten us on what have been the major shifts in the way that people use the internet and how these changes have caused cybersecurity or online safety to become more important. Absolutely. You know, the pandemic has really accelerated our reliance on the internet. It's, fo uh, it's forced all of us to really quickly pivot to using more online products and services than ever before. Um, and it's changed how we do so many everyday activities, whether that's keeping in touch with friends and family, going to work, going to school, and more. And as we've seen uh, more and more services move online, people have had to, uh, had to create new accounts. We saw that the average person was creating 15 new accounts during the pandemic, uh, and internet use has just skyrocketed. But as that's happened, bad actors have been able to also capitalize on those same trends. So for example, we saw phishing scams related to COVID-19 spike over 200% during the height of the pandemic. Um, we've seen ransomware and cyber attacks that target schools and local governments and businesses and so much more. And so online safety has really quickly become a global issue and one that people are really taking notice of. So just last year, we saw that searches for cybersecurity related information reached an all time high. And so it's a clear signal that people are looking for ways to better protect themselves online. Thank you. 
Definitely. Yeah. It's, um, it's been a big change and definitely um, a lot of scammers. And with that, with the emergence of more online scams and cyber threats, it is easy for ordinary persons to be at risk online. Can you tell us some of the everyday challenges that people face in keeping safe on the internet and what signs and signals users should be looking out for as they try to keep themselves protected? Absolutely. You know, I think one of the big challenges that people face as they're trying to stay safe online is just staying educated um, on what should you be doing to keep yourself safe. You know, I think we all have common sense things that we do to protect our physical safety, right? You don't walk down the street and get into a car with a stranger or uh, hand your you know, banking information to someone that you don't know. Um, and I think we need people to have a similar level of education around what are best practices when it comes to digital safety, right? How do you spot a malicious website? How do you avoid getting your email fished? How do you practice good hygiene when it comes to your passwords? Um, and I think it's safe to say that today, people don't always have easy access to the tools or the skills to help them uh, in this journey to online safety. Um, and so that's why at Google, we've been working to make online safety education more easily accessible to people. We have something called our Be Internet Awesome initiative, which is a program geared at teaching kids how to use the internet responsibly uh, through playing games that along the way teach them about responsible digital citizenship. Um, and we're also excited to now be expanding these efforts through a partnership with Khan Academy, where we're contributing $5 million to work together to put uh, courses on, online uh, through the Khan Academy platform where everyone can learn more about what they can do uh, to keep themselves safe online. Definitely. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, education is definitely central to this. We all have a part to play in ensuring secure and safe use of the internet. But what exactly is the role of technology companies in empowering users to take control of their online safety? And how can we all play a part in making the internet a safer place? Yeah, we think about this a lot um, and we feel an enormous responsibility to protect our users and help keep them safe. Um, you know, it starts with what we're doing when people are using Google products, right? We want to make sure that all of our Google products are as safe as possible. Um, and that's why everything we build um, is designed to be secure by default, right? Building security right in so that you don't need to worry. Um, and we also, when we're designing our products, think about how do we design them to be private so that your data is protected and that you're in control. Um, but we also know that people are using the internet far beyond just Google products. Um, and so that's why we're also so committed to do things like help provide education around how to stay safe online, no matter what products you're using. Um, that's why we're doing the partnership I just referenced with Khan Academy uh, for online safety education. Um, it's why we support uh, initiatives funding open source uh, software security um, and working with leading cybersecurity experts to find and patch vulnerabilities um, in the devices and services that people use every day. Um, and we have teams of security experts that are identifying and warning the broader security uh, community uh, about emerging cyber threats as they, uh, as they come up. And I think it's just really critical that as more and more services become digitized, that companies, governments, schools, everybody takes steps to really secure their digital footprint, to do that education work that we talked about and help everybody stay safe online. Awesome, thank you so much. Before you go, Jen, and you've touched on this a bit, but you can just share in anything else about what Google's doing to support users who are trying to stay safe online and help make them better, more informed decisions about their privacy and security in pursuit of that goal. Absolutely. You know, the first thing is really building security and privacy features directly into our products to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep people safe uh, when they're using Google. So a couple specific examples, things like putting you as a user in control of how your online activity is saved, um, making sure that when you browse the web that you're doing it safely, um, flagging malicious emails before you click on that dangerous link. Um, this is the type of work that my team is doing day in and day out um, and constantly thinking about what are ways that we can keep you safer uh, when you're using Google products and services. 
Um, last year, we took a big step um, and enrolled more than 150 million people in two-step verification. Um, this is an uh, extra verification step that really increases your, your, um, your security and really significantly decreases the ability of an attacker to access your account. Um, and with that initiative, we just learned that we actually cut in half the number of hijacked accounts, um, which is something that's super important as more and more uh, bad actors are targeting people's accounts and trying to gain uh, malicious access to them. Um, we also are really focused on high risk users um, and how do we help them practice better security. Um, so an example there is we just launched something called the Campaign Security Project. Um, and this is geared at providing organizations across the political spectrum uh, with tools to help train, whether it's political candidates or campaign workers, on how they can stay safe and protected online. Um, and that's, of course, in addition to all of the education work uh, that I already talked about. Thank you so much, Jen, for that very insightful information. We all learned a lot, I'm sure. And thank you for joining Axios View from the Top segment. Thanks, Mia. Great to be here. Now over to Axios Chief Technology Correspondent, Ina Freed. I'm Ina Freed, Chief Technology Correspondent for Axios. Our final guest today is the Interim Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance, Lisa Plagemeyer, joining us from Austin, Texas. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Lisa, obviously cybersecurity issues are very real. They're very big and significant and should be taken seriously. Um, but you have really pointed out that we're not doing ourselves any favors, both in the way that we talk about cybersecurity problems and in the way we talk about the solutions. Let's talk first about the issues that really confront us. We use a lot of war imagery and tech terminology. We talk about, you know, attacks and defense. Why isn't that appropriate? I mean, there is true cyber attacks happening. There are nation states doing this. What are we losing when we frame this as a military style attack? Uh, we're framing every we're losing everybody that doesn't work in security or in the military. <laughs> we're losing people like my mom and my kids. And frankly, we're losing a lot of the general public that is just up to here with stress these days, mainly because of the pandemic, mainly because of everything we've been through the past couple of years. You know, dial back to the early days of the pandemic. We had a, a contentious election. Uh, I was working for a company in Seattle at the time. We had all the Capitol Hill stuff going on. Just a, a lot happening in society that's that's stressing people out. I can just think of the number of friends that I have that have pretty much given up watching the nightly news because they're so tired of, of bad news. And the pandemic has just put people over the edge emotionally. If you ask people that work in UX or UI design, they will say the exact same thing, that they have learned that in order to engage technology users more during this time, they have to lean into positivity. They have to lean into using bright colors and, and um, imagery that makes people smile or makes people laugh instead of things that are just more doom and gloom. And that's really the problem is that militaristic tone um, and that type of language is really tone deaf for these times. Um, people, people can only cope with so much. Totally. And we don't really realize it at first because, you know, I mean, again, there are nation states attacking one another using cyber technology. So it's not inaccurate. But to your point, I mean, you know, everyone wants to encourage their family members to be safe when they go out late at night. But we don't yell and scream, oh, my God, there are muggers everywhere. We just say, hey, you know, you know, maybe bring a friend with you when you walk out. We, we provide that information in a different way. It sounds like that's some of what you're advocating here. Absolutely. If we want people to engage, if we want people to take simple steps to protect themselves and their families, then, then we have to show that there's an upside to it instead of always talking about the potential downside if they don't do these things. And I love there was a commercial, I can't remember who it's for, so they're not going to get the plug. But one of the tech companies had a thing where everyone was like saying their passwords out loud and revealing all their secrets. And they were getting that same message across, but again, using a way that doesn't freak out an already exhausted public. So let's shift yeah. the conversation for a moment to talk about some of the things people can do. And one of the most consistent recommendations over the years has been around how we prove who we are. 
And for a long time, that's been passwords. Passwords are not very good for a variety of reasons, um, mm -hmm. but it's been really hard to get people to shift away from them, both individuals, but also tech companies. And the best answer the industry has come up with Again, we've used just a terrible name, as you point out, to describe it. We talk about multi-factor authentication, and it reminds me of, you know, if we sold sushi as cold, raw fish, it probably wouldn't go over that well. What are we really talking about here, and how could we make this sound a whole lot better? Yeah, this is just uh, proving that you're you in more ways than one. You know, there's something you have and something you know and, um, or, and or something you are. So when when I describe it that way to my to my dear sweet old mother, <laughs> then she then she kind of gets it. Um, I do wish we had a different term for it. I think the term is really off putting and kind of alienating to to people that aren't in technology. Um, but it's really critical, and it's one of those things that's so critical that I you know I haven't actually tried to do any hard research and looked at numbers, but. Can you imagine what the world would look like if 80% of us all used MFA, um, you know, with the kind of dent that that could make in global cybercrime? I mean, it's that powerful. So I often tell people that if, you, that if you're using a financial institution that doesn't use MFA, that you should get a new bank. And, and, and I say that a little bit in jest, but not so much. It's, it's really that important. And one of the best ways I shouldn't say best ways. One of the ways that's been most common to do this is also not the most secure. It may be better than nothing, but it's that, you know, we'll send a text to your phone. Um, mm -hmm. It's great on the one hand because we all carry our smartphones. It's very convenient, um, but it's also problematic because the phones themselves can be easily separated, not just the physical phone, but the account from the person. Uh, is that... Right. Uh, the end game here, or is there a better way than, you know, uh, uh, my bank, my cable company, whomever is sending a text to my phone and sending a code? Well, oftentimes when you have the choice of a code, you also have the choice of an email. So that's another option. And hopefully you've protected your email with multi-factor authentication as well. Or there's push notifications that are that are more and more popular. Things like, um, you know, Duo Security and those types of apps where they just push a uh, notification to you. And um, and you just say, yep, that's me, and and off you go. So in the time we have left, I, I think it would be really useful to kind of break down, because there's a bunch of different actors in this that can be part of the solution or part of improving things. There's companies, there's governments, and there's individuals. What should the tech companies, and not just the tech companies, but the companies that employ technology, and there's a big distinction there. Your bank isn't a tech company, or it more and more is. Right but it's a company that employs technology. What should companies be doing, particularly to protect the most vulnerable? So I think mandating multi-factor authentication, you know, making it, making it a prerequisite for your customers as opposed to a choice. Um, and if you do make it a choice, hiding it deep inside your security settings somewhere is probably not the easiest way for people to find it. Communicate with your customers about security. I think a lot of um, consumer-facing organizations are afraid to communicate about cybersecurity because maybe they're afraid they live in a, a glass house or it's a scary subject and it's not going to reflect well on their brand. But you can do it in a way that, that really um, uses security as a brand asset. And so sending out helpful tips to your customers on how to use your particular service or how to even know that um, an email that they've gotten isn't really from you. It's from somebody trying to trying to fish them using your good your good name and your good brand. I think it's it's really helpful to talk to your customers about these things. Yeah, I loved one of the things one of my banks did one time. I can't remember if they're still doing this, but they had me pick an image out of a choice of 100 um, so that when they were communicating with me, I knew it was them. And it was just another right. step to kind of avoid phishing. I mean, one of my pet peeves is when companies uh, use in their proactive communications the same sorts of techniques that hackers use to phish. Um, how important is it that companies are sensitive in the way that they communicate with us, not just the way that we authenticate who we are? Well, a lot of companies will tell you, you'll, you'll know it's us if, 
right? Like we'll never ask you for your PIN number. We'll never ask you for your full social security number, things like that. And so I think that's really important to communicate to your, to your customers because your customers aren't just dealing with you. They're dealing with a lot of other companies. And so remembering these things for customers can be, can be difficult. The other thing I think that would help is um, I'm going to pick on the news media a little bit. The, the images of hackers and hoodies and the, the FUD, uh, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that the media uses when they report on uh, some of the bad things that happen, data breaches that happen, I think that causes a lot of breach apathy and breach fatigue on the part of consumers as well and causes them to, to tune out and to not take the simple actions they could to protect themselves. And what about the role of government? Um, you talked about companies requiring multi-factor authentication, but one of the ways that companies are pushed to do things is when the government mandates it. Um, should certain types of transactions be required by, by government, by law, to use more than one way of identifying their customers? I, you know, I don't know if it should go so far as to be legislated. You know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of it, but I think there, there's more than one way to eat the elephant. And so I think it's more about having a, a standard for um, not being specific about what ty type of technology should be used. But that, um, but that you should have to, you know, authenticate people in, in more than one way. Um, I think the executive order that came out last year um, goes a long way in the in the right direction. And um, if you don't know what that is, then Google it and read it yourself. There's also kind of a Cliff Notes version out there, a summary out there. But there's a lot of good information um, there on 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 all kinds of security and and secure coding, secure technology development advice. Well, thank you so much. Obviously, there's a ton more we could talk about. There's a ton more that people could learn. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things we can do is demystify the problem. So thank you so much, Lisa Plagemeyer, the Interim Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Thank you. Thank you all for joining this afternoon for what I hope was another conversation that's made us all a little bit smarter, faster. For more information or to sign up for my Axios login newsletter or Sarah's Axios Media Trends newsletter, visit axios.com slash newsletters or check out the Axios app. Once again, thank you for joining and we'll see you on axios.com.